Take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. We'll read the last verse in chapter 4 and then the first verse in chapter 5. And I'd like to bring a message entitled, Protecting Our Freedoms, today. And as we pause, as we're going through the Gospel of John for this wonderful 4th of July weekend, I'm sure some of you are still recovering from a a night's sleep that was a little bit lesser than normal. We had um, a retired patriotic naval um, colonel around the corner from us who I think spent about $3,000 on fireworks. He was in the missile department in the Navy, and I think he likes to think, see things go up and go boom. So from late last night, we were enjoying his fireworks, so praise God. I'm really, really thrilled at all of the patriotic attire that I see you wearing today, and I'm thrilled at all the fireworks that are going up. It, it is a, um, reassuring to see just how many people love our country and love our God and what he's done here. So... Read with me in Galatians chapter 4, verse 31, the last verse in chapter 4. The Bible says, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And in context here, the Israelites are helping to be led into freedom of Christ rather than bondage of the law. And in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That is, he's referring to the book of the law, the Torah. Do not look at the Torah as your means to be right with God. Christ is your means to be right with God. Now, I've read from the New King James translation today because I have my American Patriots Bible with me. Now, my wife says, Casey, you've got an addiction to Bibles, don't you? And I thought, well, what better addiction can you have? So um, I have my American Patriots Bible, and it's fantastic. It's full of quotes that you would love to read as I, and um, I brought that with me today. So if you'd notice that I'm not reading from the New American Standard, that's why. And I am okay with my Bible addiction. I hope you are too. Keep it. I'll do that. Now this verse has two different parts, both a claim, all right, and a command. And and first, this claim is to be free. So point number one in today's message is to be free. Now let me tell you, we have, before we get into some of this verse, and by the way, I generally am a very strict, or as strict as I possibly can, at being exegetical. And what that means is I just simply expose the truths of God, God's word. I say what the Bible says, and then I apply it to our everyday life after we have interpreted what we've observed. And so today, we're gonna take a passage of scripture and compare it to what we are experiencing today. So it's not exegetical truth, it is God's truth compared to what we are experiencing today. And what are we experiencing today? Let me tell you, if you're in tune with what's going on around our nation and even in around the world in England and in Australia, you're gonna see the furtherance of history being erased. Isn't that sad? Not only that, the removal of monuments. That's where we're at today and defunding police. That's just crazy. Now listen to me. These are going to be yokes of bondage. I'm comparing all of these things that I'm fixing to list to you today as if the Israelites were to backslide back into following the law rather than adhering to the freedoms in Christ. And so erasing history, removing monuments, defunding police, the Black Lives Matter movement, which is Marxist, the Antifa movement, the communist movement, the wokeness, the social justice the identity politics, racism, climate change, gender equality, Islam is still a threat, by the way. And then also for us, you might not like me for categorizing the next two items in this list, but I'm gonna do it anyway because I believe that it's the truth. Listen to me. Among these 15 yokes, I truly believe that entertainment among Christianity is a yoke. And I also think that complacency is also a yoke. Christian complacency is as bad as the Jews who have 
renounced Judaism and found Christ as their Lord and Savior, it's just as bad as them eroding back from their true Christianity to following the law again. And Paul here is correcting them in the book of Galatians, which is a very stern letter. This is probably the sternest New Testament book. And in verse One of chapter five, he says, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made you free. So, like I said, this verse has two parts. One part's referring to the claim, and that claim is that Christ set us free so that we would be free. And the second part of this verse, which we'll explore here in just a little while, is the command to stand firm. And so I want to give us a main idea to think on as I go through this message to protect our freedoms that Christ has given us. Protect our freedoms that Christ has given us. All right, so we see all the way back from Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16 that it has been established even in the Mosaic law that circumcision is for the heart. It's not externally. It says circumcise your hearts therefore and stiffen your necks no longer. Can you believe that you would be identified as a stick necked neck person if you fall into one of these different yokes. Now, in times past, the Israelites had thought of circumcision, temple sacrifices, dietary laws, and feasts, and Passovers, and such, as to keep them spotless and clean before the Lord. Their trying and trying and trying was actually bringing them into bondage. Now, they had already escaped the Egyptian bondage of slavery and gone through the wilderness, and now they're in New Testament times, and they're escaping some Some of them are the bondage of the law. And so some of them actually went from historically one bondage to another bondage. And we're in threat of doing that here in America, from going from freedom back into bondage. And so the opposite of freedom is what? Slavery. Jesus died on the cross so that we would be free and finally free, and we got to protect this freedom. John 8, 36 says this, so if the Son of Man makes you free, you will be free Indeed, if you'd like to be enslaved indeed, then be ignorant to these 15 yokes. I say that with all the compassion that I can possibly muster up. But if we are ignorant as Christians, we'll simply roll over like a Labrador and let somebody else take over our house. We cannot do that, guys. We cannot do it. Listen, if you read the websites for which these movements have even posted online, you will see their agendas are anti-Christ, anti-biblical, anti-Judeo-Christian value. So do not get drawn in. Don't get sucked in to these movements. Let me tell you, people will surprise you. you I'd be surprised of how many of you guys and, and, and whatnot have maybe been tempted to jump on board and to advocate or to have compassion for one of these movements. Now, I don't want to get too far into that. I want to try and stay in our freedom of Christ, but I sense, as you probably do, our freedoms being attacked here in America. Now, here in America, many have given their lives historically for the freedom that we now enjoy. How many people died in the Revolutionary War? 50,000 souls died. And if those souls had families, how many people were directly emotionally impacted and financially impacted by the Revolutionary War? And their deaths cannot be in vain. We've got to fight for them. A matter of fact, 20,000 passed in the War of 1812. And so that all men... And women, no matter how much melanin is in their skin, 655,000 people died in our own civil war so that all men could be free. Now, I understand the complexities of the Civil War, and it was just not uh, about the Emancipation Proclamation, but that is one of the main things for which 655,000 people, soldiers, died for. Now, there was 320,000 in World War I, 100, no, 1 million plus in World War II, 128,000 in the Korean War, 211,000 in the Vietnam War, 22,000 in the war in in Afghanistan, 36,000 in the Iraq War. Don't you see that our freedom is not free? 
How much has it cost? It has cost 2,852,901 lives for our freedom here in America. Nearly 3 million lives have been given. They've shed their blood. They've died either by disease or on the battlefield so that we can experience this freedom that we so enjoy. The freedom to be able to come here and worship our God. The freedom to be able to vote and to not have a, a king lording over us. The freedom that we enjoy so much. Millions have gone before us and millions have paid the ultimate price so that we can have the freedom of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Listen to this story from missionary Nick Ripkin. He tells a story of this man named Stoyan. And Stoyan's name means stand firm. Listen closely. It is a common name in Eastern Europe. And after the end of World War I, the communists began consolidating their power in this country. And they took control of the government. And for decades, they suppressed Christians. Stoyan was 12 when the brutal communist party imprisoned his father who was a Protestant pastor. Now at first, he was taken by the secret police and jailed for just 10 years. Every day the police would contaminate this man's breakfast in the most unimaginable ways. This was normal to persecute Christians in such a fashion. And Stoyan's mother received word that the police were moving Stoyan's father to a distant labor camp and they were gonna be allowed to visit Stoyan's father. This Protestant pastor has been arrested by the communist police. They were gonna be able to visit him for just one hour. And so Stoyan and his mother went to the well-known torture facility. All the prisoners ran out to see their families, but not Stoyan's father. The communist carried him out and laid his skeletal body down in front of his family. He looked like worn dish rags. Stoyan and his mother only recognized his eyes, his piercing blue eyes. Stoyan was 13. He took his father by the hand and he said to him, Papa, I'm so proud of you. Stoyan's mother tried to slip a Bible into his garment because she knew that this would be able to encourage him in the days. A guard saw this and he yelled out, I could kill you right now for treason and be awarded for it. I could kill you, your son, and your husband. And I could be applauded for it. When the officer confiscated the Bible, the mother replied, and I want you to hear this because I think that we need this kind of resolve in our bones. She said, you can kill my husband, you can kill me, and you can even kill my son, but nothing you can do will ever separate me from the love and freedom that is in Jesus Christ. And I think at that moment, that was downloaded into her son, Stoyan, and he grew up to be a pastor himself. He distributed Bibles, he gave out Bibles, and then he was also imprisoned many times. Nick Ripkin, a famous missionary, tells this story of Stoyan when he had the opportunity to interview Stoyan when Stoyan was 60 years old. Nick Ripkin is still alive today, he's a missionary out of Kentucky, and he interviewed Stoyan when he was 60 years old some years ago. And here, Nick Ripkin told us at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary what Stoyan had to say to us Christians. Are you ready for this? Stoyan's dad died through this communist persecution. It was awful what he went through. And now Stoyan has been faithful to the ministry for his entire life and at 60 years old, he downloads this story to Nick Ripkin. Nick Ripkin, a missionary over there, comes back over here. Nick Ripkin is not his real name, by the way. It's a facade so that he can go into these dangerous places and share the gospel without his family being harmed. Nick Ripkin comes back to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm just a preacher boy on the pew listening to this testimony. And he said that Stoyan said that his challenge for Christians in America is this. Don't ever give up in freedom what we would never give up in persecution. Don't ever give up in freedom what we would never give up in persecution. We've got to stand firm. 
Listen, folks, not only have millions died, gone before us so that we could live in freedom, but people around the world are looking at us and they're thinking to themselves, y'all better not give up what God has given you. We have fought tooth and nail to have what we have and it's cost us dearly as well. So point number two is the command to stand firm and to further drive this point home to not lose what we have. I wanna quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer a pastor while Hitler was in power. And he led a movement speaking out against the Nazi party. And he was banned from Berlin and arrested for conspiracy. He was hung in a German concentration camp. And here's his quote, being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than it is about courageously and actively doing God's will. Come on, guys. Don't be self-centered and always thinking about, oh, what can I do to sanctify myself and always, always, always looking inward. Get out and be active. President Lincoln said this as a 16th president from 1861 to 1865. He said, I like to see a man proud of the place in which he lives. I like to see a man live so that the place will be proud of him. Hey, Edmund Burke said this, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. In light of that quote, I've got a quote, so maybe you can quote me one day. All that is necessary for Christianity to fade away is for lazy Christians to say, okay. If we just roll over and if we allow the movements that are happening in today's realm to take us over and we just sit back, it's just like saying, okay. Okay, President Lincoln also said, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side for God is always right. And I truly believe with all of my heart, if we're gonna be on God's side, then we're going to be men and women with good, strong Christian fortitude. We're not gonna be pushed back into a corner without speaking up. We're not gonna go to heaven without saying to ourselves, we gave it our dead level best. We lived out our faith and we spoke up when we needed to speak up. And we have to be influencers and not influenced. This is an agenda that is happening in our own country. And if we don't wisen up to the fact and encourage that people would receive Jesus Christ as their personal savior and evangelize them and convert them so that their soul can have the Holy Spirit conviction upon them so that they would in turn vote for biblical values, we're gonna lose our nation. It's gonna slip away. And we're to blame, starting with the church of God. We're to blame. So we must influence. We've got to get our sons and our daughters and our children engaged in moving things for the gospel. Ephesians 6.10 says to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. A high price was paid for our freedoms. Millions died. Millions who came over as immigrants never dreamed of the life that we would be living today. They endured starvation, disease, and war. And they risked it all to come over here for a new start, far away from what they would have known in their history as a British monarchy, or to the south, an Egyptian slavery, or in their recent history, which they all would have known very well because of a Colosseum that was planted right there in the middle of their land, the Roman era, and then, obviously, the threat of Chinese communism you can imagine that these immigrants wanted to settle in a new land for the opportunities that were there. So in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And then in the 1500s, the pilgrims and the Puritans came to America to practice religious freedom. Yes, that was difficult on both sides. It was difficult to get away when it's difficult to get here and it's difficult to survive. In the 1600s, folks who were tired of the oppression and abuse formed what would be called the Protestant Reformation. And from there, folks came to this new land and they formed colonies like Virginia and the Carolinas and Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and more. Now, these settlements, they might have been small, these colonies, they might have been far away from one another, but God would strengthen these colonies that I want you to listen closely to how they endured these harsh winters 
without any luxuries, without any guarantees, carving out a life. Listen, you know, one time I was in the mountains of North Carolina and someone who was very close to passing, he was, he was so old, he had just a, a weak voice, he was barely hanging on to life, and he said to me personally, he said, Casey, um, our family comes from Ireland, and when the Irish came over here into the mountains of North Carolina, we came with our saws and we cut down the trees and we removed the trees on these steep mountain hills and then with our pickaxes and our donkeys we would work on one single stump for weeks to try and get this stump out of the ground and then once we got 10 or 12 stumps out of the ground we finally had just a little piece of ground to where we could cultivate the ground and plant some something to survive by and you see we had to get that done in time for spring but yet in the winter time the ground is frozen you see how the obstacles were immense for the people just to even survive on getting here but yet they carved out a living and they experienced the loss of their babies dying and their wives dying in childbirth they experienced starvation they experienced the freezing temperatures they experienced all of these things and yet they're just simply trying to carve out a life People were dying and struggling in this area. You know, when Christopher Columbus come over, he established a really good relationship with the tribe of Indians, and he said this, and I quote Christopher Columbus, I cannot believe that we have found a people with such good hearts, so giving and so timid, that they would strip themselves of everything and give all that they have to us. And this same Indian tribe warned Christopher Columbus and all of his partners in that, in that uh, voyage that there are other people around here that are cannibals, so be careful. He warned them, he did that, you know? If you couldn't tell, we have one of our own, John Thompson, who has strong Indian roots from the Lamanope tribe, and I'm proud of him. He's also a giver, he's also a wonderful guy. I love him to death but he does not live in a tent nor ride a horse anymore. Love John, thank you for your Christian and Indian heritage. Beyond all of that, beyond the struggles, and as they would settle in these colonies, God was up to something, I'm gonna bring this together for you. Plantations eventually were established, and the trade routes from England and back would cease and they would start trading with one another in their tobacco and their cotton and their produce and their goods. Conditions were still really harsh. Morale was still really low. Can you imagine experiencing your entire life without really wearing a smile that often? Morale was low for a long time as America was first getting started. People were dying simply just trying to carve out a life. Yet, the masses were moving over here, yet the masses were on ships and they're just coming one ship after another and after another. And in this, God brought some preachers to this new world. And with these preachers, the first great awakening woke the people up and started to see that people would come out from underneath the bondage of sin and into the light of Christ. The preaching like from Jonathan Edwards brought revival and his powerful sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, shook this new land. And all of the people responded to his preaching. Preaching like that of George Whitfield and John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards articulated theology. Listen to me, they didn't preach shallow sermons to these folks in whom they would wrongly presumed that they were uneducated or unable to write. They preached deep theological messages and they also preached with conviction on how to be saved. Their preaching transcended denominational lines and historical dividing lines and racial barriers and economic barriers. Migrant workers, plantation owners, slaves, tourists, residents, everybody was affected by their powerful Preaching, revival then swept through these 13 colonies. Now get the picture. You've got 13 different colonies and people just struggling with the threat of Great Britain coming over and burning them down or taking them over or whatever the case might be. But in the midst of all of this struggling, in the midst of all of this low morale and death, you've got preachers preaching the gospel and people are coming to Christ and they're starting to find a new found 
happiness in God. And guess what this happiness did? This happiness birthed in them motivation and strength. Thousands of people were saved through the first great awakening of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and John Wesley. This salvation and this happiness led to inspiration and strength of will, which brought confidence. Now, you see, the gospel brings a person to the, to the point to where they care about their neighbor and their decency, right? And so they start talking in the midst of one another. And as these preachers are on horseback, going from one colony to another colony to the next colony and back and forth, they're establishing these trade routes and these routes of communication. And so before, these little colonies, they were divided. But now they're getting to the point to where they're united. And they say, hey, we got neighbors about two hours through the woods on this side. And we got friends about three hours on this side. We got a land that's coming together. And as they stumbled upon this newfound strength because of the preachers uniting the people through the gospel, they then felt the confidence that they could unite and stand against the great British Empire. And so that led to the Revolutionary War. And let me tell you, England still today blames the Protestant pastors for their losing the war. Let me tell you why. It's because of the black-robed regiment. When the pastors saw that we were going to enter into war, they took what they would commonly wear as a black robe and, and some white collared here. They took those off and they picked up their muskets and they led men out of the church from their families to go to war. And this war, the Revolutionary War, was fought by good Christian men. It was because of the pastors who rallied up and said, guys, we must fight for our freedom. We must maintain this land. Otherwise, we're gonna be taken over. And so we have this command in the scriptures not only to stand in our liberty and in our freedom in Christ, but I'm comparing it today that we must also stand in the freedoms that we have in this nation that were based upon those very roots. We are rooted in freedom in Christ. This led up to the Revolutionary War. And I think today we're facing a unique war. So I'm saying to us, based on Galatians 5.1, to keep standing and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Our military is strong enough to keep another country from coming onto our land, so they're going a different route. They're going all kinds of different routes. They're penetrating our education system. They're penetrating our politics. They're penetrating in all different kinds of ways. George Santayana said this, if you don't learn from history, history will repeat itself. Standing firm means more than just standing where you are in your position. It means being saved. And in that freedom, you are spreading freedom and you're taking over land. God commanded Joshua to take Canaan land and he's commanded us to take the land today by way of making disciples. So we have a conundrum on our hands and my question to us is will we stand firm? Will we stand firm? Will we educate our sons and our daughters and our friends and our neighbors? Will we take this passion and reduplicate it, which is like the Great Commission to make disciples who can make disciples? It is leadership training. Will we indoctrinate our sons and daughters? Will we take these convictions and hold on to our country? Will we partner with God and continue to fight against this siege? Yes, our country is under siege. Look at this. Erasing history, removing monuments, defunding police, BLM, Antifa, Marxism, wokeness, social justice, Islam, identity politics, racism, climate change, gender equality, lazy Christians who are focused on entertainment and comfort. And if we continue down this lazy path, how in the world would we expect something different in our near future. We are under siege. I can count 15 yokes. I guarantee you there's a whole many more underneath the surface that I just can't think off the top of my mind that are actually happened. Satan is so conniving. I'm guaranteeing you there is a lot going on. Let me prove it to you. 
Colleges and universities always are known for their studies. Well, they have been studied, and the Barna Research Group studied the professors, and out of 40 of the top-rated universities, liberals show that they dominate academia. Research shows that out of 4,000 professors, listen to me, 4,000 professors, out of them, only 314 were conservative. Folks, we're in trouble. Higher education is consumed with this Marxism mentality and this liberal, amoral, humanistic agenda. Our colleges are consumed with this. Our high schools and our middle schools and even our kids' curriculum through a secular public school education system is now giving ground to more of an Islamic educational background than Christianity. Have you gone to a high school and read their history book? I have. I've looked through their history book. A thick history book nowadays is like this. You know what I could find as I slipped flipped through that in about over an hour's time as I was flipping through the whole thing? I found one paragraph on Christianity. American history book. One paragraph on Christianity. Christianity has been removed and the rest of the history has been skewed. Guys, we've got to rescue our children. We have the right to educate them as to what really happened in our country and how we have what we have. And by the way, I thought maybe I was having a flighty day or something. I took the history book over to a friend of mine. I said, will you read this paragraph? And he read it too. And I said, can you understand that? And he said, no, it's nonsensical. You can't even understand it. So the only paragraph in an entire eighth grade history book is nonsensical for Christianity. Is this not intentional? It is. And so therefore, we too must be intentional as Christian strangers in the land. By the way, I believe that our churches will be purified and filled back up again with true Christianity as we experience persecution, which is coming through the observation of the scriptures. That's why I believe that. Not only our colleges and our universities are just tainted with liberal professors, but even in our own movies and entertainment, they're under siege. The LBGTQZYXUZ movement is all over the programs. It's all, it's embedded. It started four decades ago. The movies, oh, they warp accurate history. You know the movie Braveheart, right? By Mel Gibson. Did you know? That that movie is the second, it has an award, by the way, it's kind of behind the scenes laughable, the second worst movie as having misrepresented history. Did you know that? That when you watch that movie, which has got some awfulness to it, that it misrepresents history. One of the most popular movies ever completely violates truth. Now, not to say that we get our theology or our history from Hollywood, but nevertheless, Many of our young people do. They'll read the headlines, they'll read the first snap of something, and then all of a sudden they've got a cause. All of a sudden they've got a reason to stand and they've only been on the subject for 30 seconds at most. So we've got to educate our people how to formulate history, how to interpret history, how to read the whole story, how to see that there always is two sides to every coin. Even kid cartoons are morally warped and untrustworthy. Folks, our country is under siege. It is under siege. I side with Jerry Vines, a longtime pastor of First Baptist Jacksonville, when he said that our Christian future will be either one of the three, ruin, revival, or rapture. Many of you are praying for the rapture, aren't you? Lord, come on. I don't want to experience it no more. Save me. Dr. Kenneth Ridings of Fruitland Baptist Bible College used to always say, Lord, your best bet is the rapture in my lifetime. (laughs) Well, rapture, revival, or ruin. That is what Jerry Vines predicted many years ago, and now we are definitely at that point. I want you to remember what Stoyan said. Don't ever give up in freedom what we would never give up in persecution. Thomas Paine said this in September 11th, 1777, those who expect to reap the blessing of freedoms must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. We gotta support it or it's gonna be gone. Let me run through some quotes from our founding fathers with you. 
John Adams, whom my wife's family are descendants of, we proudly say, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he said, I have examined all religions, and the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. Samuel Adams, a signer of the Declaration, said this, I rely upon the merits of Jesus Christ for a pardon of all my sins. Joshua Barlett said this, and he was also a signer and a judge and a governor of New Hampshire. I call upon the people of New Hampshire to confess before God their aggravated transgressions and implore him pardon and forgiveness through the merits of the meditation of Jesus Christ that the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ may be made known to all the nations, pure and undefiled religion, and in the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord." Charles Carroll, a congressman, a signer, also said this, the great vital and conservative element in our system is to believe, is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and the divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. John Dickinson, a signer, said this, rendering to my creator for my existence and for my birth and country of, in light, in, that's been enlightened by the gospel and enjoying freedom and for all of his other kindnesses, to him I reside myself, humbly confiding in his goodness and in his mercy through Jesus for the events of eternity. We cannot continue to let these things slip away, folks. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So it starts with the house of God, those of us who are Christians on our knees and praying, and then in private while we pray, we get that unction to be able to be bold and speak up in public and to go forth and proclaim the gospel, which has the transformative power to change people and to lead them to Christ. Proverbs 14, 34 says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And if you believe that, then you'll address it. No one would allow sin to penetrate their house and to destroy their family without addressing it. But yet we see how sin is penetrating our nation and it seems like we have very few Christian or conservative voices speaking up for our Judeo-Christian biblical values. Where are the voices? Where are they at? It's time to speak up. So point number three as I wrap up quickly is the call. The call. May I extend to you a call to action to be salt and light and to pray and to do good. Did you know that the Bible puts all of us into an inescapable corner to do good when James said this, to him who knows the good and does not do it, to him it is sin. James four seventeen. When we know the good that we ought to do and we do not do it, God places sin upon your life. And those of you who may be underneath that element of lackadaisical sin have, according to Psalms 68, I think it's verse 18 or so, an altered prayer life. If there is sin in your life, then your prayers are not being heard by the Almighty. And so my call is for Christians to speak up and to live out these seven Judeo-Christian principles that our founding fathers knew and built this country upon. And I read them quickly, and I want to encourage you that if you want to take notes on these, do that maybe later today or tomorrow when this sermon is uploaded on YouTube, because I'm just going to run through them. I want you to listen to them. You can get them again online. These next seven principles are our foundational truths in which the founding fathers understood and they founded the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights and other important documents with. This is who they were, okay? And now I'm calling us to live out and to speak out these same principles. Principle number one is the dignity of human life. 
Exodus 20, 13 says you shall not murder. Guys, number one principle. There should be only one gauge on why or where or who you vote for this November. It is on life, life. The abortion rate makes us as guilty of murder as any other horrid country in all of humanity. And yet we don't even hardly think about it. Dignity of all human life. You shall not murder. Abortion is most certainly murder. Principle number two, the traditional monogamous family. Based upon Genesis chapter two, Verses 23 and 24, we see that Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now you see God's plan for the family right there. And that traditional view of a husband and wife and their children in a family is the strength behind churches and nations. Principle number two is a traditional monogamous family. Principle number three is a national work ethic. Second Thessalonians 3.10 says, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone would not work, neither shall you eat. If a man's not gonna work, he ain't gonna eat. Bye-bye welfare system. Now, I'm for helping people when they're hurt and they're down, but I don't want to finance somebody's life for the rest of their life and reward laziness. Guys, we are in the land of opportunity, and anybody can go out and get a job. And by the way, you don't have to have a four-year degree to get a job. There are more trades out there than you can imagine. Getting a trade mastered and going into the workforce is providing dignity for young men and women. And they can still have a wonderful life in Christ in this country by being a tradesman. So the dignity of work. Principle number three. Principle number four, the right to a God-centered education. Listen to Ephesians 6, 4. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admon admonition of the Lord. Hey, if you're listening today, listen to me. Deuteronomy chapter six gives us a commandment and then the New Testament drives it home even farther and especially the fathers are not included in educating their children. They must, by example and by their words, live out and speak and teach a God-centered education. One of the things that has been a mile marker in my life was when an influential man said in my life over and over and over and over and over again, show me a verse. As I was an eager beaver as a young man and I had ideas after ideas after ideas after ideas, show me a verse, show me a verse, show me a verse. And when you have an idea, when you have all of these different yokes or ideas coming up in the nation today or what do you wanna do with your life or how do you think or how do you believe, what do you believe and how your belief directs your behavior, show me a verse. Teach people to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if they can be standing on solid ground based upon the word of God, then they can move forward in confidence and not worry, not have to fear. But if we just send people out into the world, zealous without knowledge, they're doomed to fail. We starts in the, in the home with us reading the scriptures, with us chewing on the concepts, with us getting our children and ourselves grounded in the word of God training them. Training is not just simply educating and giving them information. It's taking the information to the next level and actually training them to apply it to their life. You get that, right? Man, when, when you are drafted as a soldier, not only are you taught what to do, but you go into what? Training. You ought to do what you've been told. And so we need to take our teaching to the next level beyond our Sunday school, beyond our Bible study groups, beyond our learning and practice them. Go out with your sons and your daughters. Go out with other people, one another, and train. Practice sharing the gospel. Train as to what is effective on how to share someone, how to get out of sin and out of bondage and into the light of Christ. Practice these things. Train one another. A good God-centered education, not only to get ourselves through the 
grammar grades or whatnot, but also in life. Principle number five, the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12, one to three helps us to understand that this Abrahamic covenant gives us a principle that if we will listen to what God has to say and do it, he will bless us in return. It's like an enduring handshake. It's like walking side by side with God. It's like signing a document, a contract. When you have a covenant with God, you're saying, I will do, thus saith the Lord. And then from there, I can depend upon your protection and blessings. One of the principles was the Abrahamic covenant. Principle number six is common decency. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine 39 says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I tell you, I don't know if you are, but I sure am. I'm convicted when I don't do something for my neighbor that I feel like I ought to do. If you see a friend or someone struggling, you can't just sit back and not help. I'm compelled from the inside, as are you, to do what you possibly can for a brother or a sister in Christ. No matter their religion, no matter their melanin, no matter their, where they're from, no matter, no matter. Decency for all common people, loving them like Christ has loved you. And the last principle, number seven, our personal accountability to God. Hebrews 9.27 says, and is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We're all gonna die, we all have that in common. We have that, but at death, what do you have? Something else that's all in common for all of us, the judgment, and so we are all accountable unto God. May we stir up our consciences. May we stir up the will inside of us to strengthen the resolve to do what's right unto God. Why? Because we're gonna be judged one day, because we're gonna have rewards, because we're gonna suffer lack of rewards if we don't, because, because, because. I hope that you have been challenged today to protect the liberties that we enjoy so much. I hope that you've been challenged today not to fall into or be drawn into any kind of law-like bondage for which there are many things today we could easily, if we are ignorant to what is happening in the world today, fall into a worldly trap and you know that getting into a trap is hard to get out of. You know that falling into a cliff or a valley is hard to get out of. One of our founders said this, it is so much easier to maintain our freedoms than to regain our freedoms. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, it's our prayer that you would give us holy resolve. Help us to protect our freedoms. Help us to influence others and not to be influenced. And God, the only way that this is possible is by your strength in us. We're powerless in the flesh, but with you inside of us, with you speaking through us, with you giving us the influence and the boldness and the ability, we can convert the lost by your power, according to Romans 1, 16. For it's the power of the gospel unto salvation, to the Jew first and then the Gentile. God, it's your power. Ephesians 6, 10 says to be strong in the Lord. And so it's your strength, Lord. We wanna be strong in you. We know how weak we are. We know how feeble we are. We know that God, that you can do mighty things through willing servants. And so that's what we must be, obedient and willing. I'm amazed, Lord, at how many little old ladies that you've used through the years to accomplish mighty things. For example, the Southern Baptist Convention has moved mountains for the Great Commission from little old Lottie Moon. May we, Lord, not look at how tall we are, how strong we are, or how loud our voice is, or how weak our voice is. May we not look at those things on the surface but look into your word for strength and then you can take like a mustard seed and make a huge tree, a canopy, something that can withstand storms. You can do mighty things through small and significant people and small and insignificant churches, which could be argued that there are none insignificant churches. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our hearts today. 
And if there is one here who desires to be saved, who knows that they are walking in sin and has never submitted their life to you, may they look upon this old rugged cross and see that you died for all of mankind's sins, that you've already paid the price, and that we don't have to try and earn atonement. We don't have to try and give sacrifices to you. We don't have to try and do more good works that outweigh our bad works and at the end of the day hope for an entrance ticket into heaven. We don't have to be ambiguous and unknowing in these areas. We can have a no-so faith, a faith that is assured that you have saved our souls. And if someone here today is caught up with the world's worries and they've never ever submitted to you and they just don't see how any of this is possible I think that's a good indication Lord that they might need to accept you as their personal Lord and Savior if they don't feel conviction when they do things wrong it's a good indication that they're not saved if they don't feel the fact that they must participate in the Great Commission themselves not just give to the cooperative program or to your church but actually go themselves and make disciples if they don't feel that conviction Lord there's something there that might be indicating that they're not saved. And, and according to John chapter 8, verses 30 and 31, if they don't have a sincere desire to study your word and to read your word and to be engaged in your word, if that desire is not there, Lord, they're either sick or they don't have you at all. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd save the lost soul this morning. And I pray that they'd cry out to you and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross and rose again for my sins. Please save me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.